Welcome to Momentum Investing, property investing made easy. One of the world's top podcasts on property investing, bringing you the top experts in the field so you can learn firsthand what it takes to create passive income and take control over your financial future. Welcome to the Momentum Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Wood, one of the founders of Momentum Property Education, and I am psyched for today's episode because we got none other than Pip Stellick. One of the people that started me on my journey, he's taught over a thousand people all over the world, shared stages with people like Gary Vaynerchuk, Robert and Kim Kiyosaki, and other amazing people. He is going to share what he's seen from working with all these people. What is it that separates those who become really successful from those who don't? This is the Momentum Investing Podcast, where we bring you experts from all over the world so that you can learn what it takes to grow your portfolio and succeed as a property investor. Make sure you subscribe here to our channel so that you don't miss any of the updates. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see our show comes out on Tuesdays where we talk about the economy, predict where the economy is going. On Thursdays, that is when the Momentum Investing Podcast comes out. And on Saturdays, we got Passive Income Mastery. So welcome here to the channel. Let's get into the interview. I am looking forward to hearing what separates those who become wildly successful from those who have done Welcome to Momentum Property Education. Welcome to the Momentum Investing Podcast. I am very excited to be here with none other than Pip Stelic, one of the people who taught me to get into property investing. Welcome to the show, Pip. Great to be here, Daniel. Uh, I'm excited just to be talking to anybody with the way the world's been the last <laughs> year and a half or so, not quite a year and a half yet, but definitely always good to talk to people and, and it, it, to be seen, if nothing else. So yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, super excited. I mean, you've spoken all over the world, taught property investing to literally thousands of people. So I'd love to hear kind of what I want to go through with you is really into the basics. Like, What does it take to start out as a property investor? And what is it that you see is the difference between those who become really successful and those who kind of fall off on the wayside? Well, yeah. And like you said, I have taught all, all over the place. I've been doing this for 19 years. I, I sat in a seat as a student 19 years ago. And um, I think the, the biggest thing I see is desire is probably the number one thing you got to have. You've got to have desire, but uh, motivation and desire without support is very tough. I mean, uh, and I can give you all kinds of examples. Uh, there's an old story about this young boy who wants to go to the moon. And this is like in the late 60s, early 70s. And uh, he really wants to go to the moon. And his, he tells his mom, hey, I want to go to the moon. I want to go to the moon. His mom says, uh, well, that sounds good. And he says, mom, I want to be the first man on the moon. And she goes, well, that's great, honey. But there's already been somebody on the moon. And he just looks totally dejected. And he walks off. And he comes back. A few hours later, he says, mom, he goes, I figured it out. He goes, I'm a problem solver. He says, I know I can't be the first man to the moon. He goes, but I want to be the first man to the sun. <laughs> and she looks at him kind of funny. And she says, well, honey, that's, a, that's awesome. But did you know that, that the sun is a big ball of fire and, uh, and it's, it's going to be very hot? He goes, mom, I'm a problem solver. I'm going to go at night. <laughs> and so the thing is, you know, you can be motivated, but you can also be a motivated idiot. So just by being motivated isn't going to get you where you need to be. So I think the two things you got to have is the motivation or desire, whatever you want to call it, and then the support, because there's a ton of, and, and you see it as well as I do, Daniel, is all the free stuff that you can find online. I call it YouTube University. And you can go online and find anything that you want. But does that mean you're going to have people to answer questions about that stuff? So I think, first of all, it's got to be motivation or desire, and then you got to have support doing it. Those are the first two ingredients. After that, then it becomes process. Then it becomes strategy. It becomes where does your market allow you to do? What's, what's good in your market? What's not good in your market? I know when I met you years ago, I, one of the things I always would tell students is, is, is go where the money is. If, if you can't find a great deal across the street, then go down the street, go across town, go to a different city, go to a different country. And, and what that does is it gives you different opportunities and it really spreads your risk out over a much bigger playing field. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, completely, completely agree. So let, let's let's dissect that a little bit. Um, like these these different parts. So if we say the three parts, desire, support, and then your process. So let's go through them one at a time. How? What do you see with like desire? I mean, a lot of people obviously listening to this podcast, they're they're listening because they are have the desire. They're they're you know you're here to learn, you're here to grow, but we get told. I know a lot of people will watch, you know, maybe Gary Vaynerchuk or Grant Cardone, and they're going like, you got to be working 80 hours a week. And, you know, it's 20 hour days. And, you know, most of us will feel like, well, what if I don't want to? What if I actually want to have a life as well? And we kind of feel as entrepreneurs that we're not doing enough. We're not working hard enough. Our desire isn't enough. What is your kind of view on both that kind of the, the work 24 hours a day, but also, if I don't have enough desire, how can I actually increase my desire? Well, a lot of people talk about having to find something that you love. And I'm not, a, I don't love property. Never have, never wake up in the morning and go, I'm excited to go look at this house or to renovate this property. I hate, I hate that kind of stuff. And, and if you really get into property, you're going to realize pretty quickly being a landlord ain't a fun job. And so what we have to think about is, first of all, what's, and, and everybody, every trainer I've ever heard talks about what's your why, why do you want this? Yeah. And so I, you got to have work life balance. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I think working 80 hours a week uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense for the average person. And most people are already working a full-time job and they do property on the side. Yeah. So I think, first of all, your expectations have to be muted a little bit. I teach students, if you can do one or two properties a year in your first year, you're an all-star. If you do more than that, you're a rock star. And so you got to keep the expectations a little bit lower. But I, but when we look at expectations, you really think about it. Obviously, it depends on your market. But even the cheapest house in the cheapest area is going to probably be, and I'm in the U.S., so you know, $40,000 U.S., is a very inexpensive property. I'm not even saying that's the best deal to get. All I'm saying though, even if you just did one forty or fifty thousand dollar property in a low income area in the U.S., um, or if you're in Scotland or wherever it is you're investing, if you did one or two of those a year, that's still a significant increase to your bottom line. Most jobs that you go out and do a second job on. You know, if you make an extra $20,000 a year at your second job or on your, what do they call it nowadays, your side hustle, people would go, that's awesome. Well, so we have to tamper that and realize property is not just a, is not, it's a cash flow game for what we teach, but it's also you're building equity, you're getting assets, and it takes a little while for that stuff to grow. Now, obviously, different markets are doing different things. Where I'm at in the U.S., everything is just exploding as far as prices go. So people that bought an asset for X amount of dollars, now we're two or three or four or five years later, and we're significantly higher. Not to mention you bought it and you made cash flow on it over time. You get tax benefits, all the other things we like about property. So I think, you know, someone, the desire has to be realistic, but it's got to be a you know, goal that you got to stretch for. So I think, you know, it's a matter of having that desire, but I really don't think most of the stuff that we teach we realize that our students are already working 40 plus hours a week. So we've got to be able to show them how to work smart, not hard. And that's what it comes down to, you know, systems, mentoring, support, those kinds of things. If you have those in place, you can do this business part time. We think you should be able to do this business if it's five hours a week, up to 20 hours a week, depending on the amount of time you have on the side as your, as people like to call it their side hustle. But I think over a period of time, you can create some significant assets for both net worth, also for cash flow and the ability to leverage. And that's why we like property so much is you have the ability to leverage. So I think the desire has to be realistic. If somebody says to me, they say, Pip, I want to you know, have 100 units. I want to have 500 units in the next 12 months. Well, how many do you have right now? I got zero. Hmm. That sounds great. I'm not saying you can't do it, but the odds of it are pretty slim. If I say to you, you know, Daniel, you got how many units right now? Oh, zero. What if we try to get one in the next 12 months? That's a that's a hundred percent, thousand percent increase over what you already got. So that's a pretty good growth rate. Any business would love that growth rate. If you got one property, you go to, you know, you go to three, you know, that, that's a that's a 200 percent increase. That's insane growth when you really think about it. 
but sometimes you know real estate is is not or property whatever you want to call it is it isn't looked at the same way i mean if i told you i was going to sell you know 200 percent more hamburgers if i have a restaurant than i did last year you go that's pretty good growth and and so we, i guess you just have to look at it what's the product that we're we're, we're purchasing but i think the desire has to be there, but I think the desire has to be realistic. And I think it's unrealistic to tell anybody that you're going to be working 100 hours a week in this business for the next two or three years. And because most people, that would totally change their life. And then they're, what's going to happen is they're going to hate it. And they're going to hate doing it. And what's going to happen is it's kind of like a, you know, uh, diets. Yeah. If all you're doing is use, all you're trying to use is willpower, you know, okay, that's great. But eventually willpower is going to turn into won't power because you have desires. You want to eat a, I'll, I'll talk about burgers again. You want to eat a burger. You want to have French fries, you know, all those kinds of things. Yeah. You can totally change your lifestyle by instead of having a burger three times a week, having it once every two weeks, still get the desire out of the way. But that's the same way. I think we have to look at property is in those manners is it's got to be realistic. No, hundred percent agree. Hundred percent agree. And and it's as you said. I mean, property is a slow game, right? You know, if you put the difference in result from putting ten hours a week to hundred hours a week is very very small, while the difference of putting zero hours a week and five hours a week is life changing. So it's the important thing is to get that momentum. And as you said, just get deal number one. Once you got deal number one, do deal number two. You've just doubled your portfolio. And then you can grow from there. And once you get a little size, I mean, right now we're taking over an 11, an 11 flats in a portfolio takeover. Yep, all of a sudden, that's some nice growth. But it takes a while to start doing bigger and bigger deals. Well, and I think success breeds more success. Because when we start talking about property, um, the nice part about it, we don't have to use our own money. So I can use... Uh, joint venture partners, angel investors, uh, we call them a lot of times, you know, the other types of lenders, private lenders, things like that here in the US. And if I've got, I've got five properties and they're going really well, and then I wanted to buy, you know, uh, another five unit portfolio or something like that, and I'm looking for a JV joint venture partner or, or other private money, they're going to ask me, well, what else have you done? Well, this is what I have right now. And this is what I just did in the last year or two. Now they're going to go, oh, this guy knows what he's doing. And so that then attracts more money to deals. And uh, one of the things I learned a long time ago, money will always follow a good deal. And I have so many people that say, well, I'm not getting financing for this. I can't get that. Well, then it's probably not a great deal because if it's a great deal, money will find it 99, 99 times out of 100, in my opinion. Awesome. So let's get to the to the next phase, the the supports part. Is there are so many, it's as you said, YouTube University. If you go to YouTube and you search for real estate, you find a million and one different trainers, you find a million and one different experts. How do we know if I'm coming in completely green? How do I find out, you know, who who do I listen to? Who don't I listen to? How do I see the difference? Well, yeah, and that's a great question. I think, first of all, realistic expectations. I mean, when somebody says, I, you know, I can show you how to, how to get 100 units or, or, or I got to, I think the one thing that bothers me the most is when they say, I did 100 properties so you can do 100 properties. Mm, I don't think so. I mean, there's so many other variables in there that you, you, you can't even put a, I mean, timing could be part of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, so many different desire issues that we just talked about. When somebody says, I've done this, you can do that, in, especially with big claims. 100 properties, 500 properties, you know, I went from zero to a, you know, a, a, a $500 million portfolio in three years. Good for you. And so I think once again, it has to come down to realistic. If I'm standing in front of you and, and, and my competition is some guy says, I can show you how to do 500 units in, in, a, in a year. And I say, I can show you how to do one or two. Well, sadly enough, the guy that says, I'll do, I can do, get you 500 is probably going to get more business than me. But at the end of the day, I'll take the, the tortoise over the hare all day long because I'll bet 99, maybe 100 out of 100 people that that person that says I can get you 500 units on is probably going to fail. Whereas if I tell you I'm going to get you one unit, I'm pretty confident that I could take 
a hundred people and 95 of them get them one, one unit. And so now we're measuring success again. And so I think you have to have, see realistic expectations on top of that. I think it's about whoever you're listening to, whoever you're following should have a team of people that are is surrounding them. Cause if I'm the only dude that you got to call, if I'm the only dude that you're looking at going, well, his portfolio is pretty good. Well, that's awesome. Whatever I've done. But if I have a whole team around me that have also done different strategies, different things, what's happening is now I've got a team of people. I was just telling you, Daniel, you know, we're, we're doing some stuff where we've created our own thing. And we've got right now, I've got uh, over 60 people on my team that are going to be working with me, for me, around me in this process. And so if I don't know the answer, then I can call upon 59 other people that are probably all 59 of them are way smarter than I'm going to be. And there's nothing wrong with that. So I don't, I'm not a big fan of trying to be the smartest person in the room. And a lot of these people on YouTube, they're trying to be the smartest guy out there and they know everything. Well, I realized a long time ago, I'd rather be happy than right. And so just because I may know something doesn't mean I'm going to sit here for 10 hours and try to convince you of it. You still have to want it. So I have to go back down to that desire. I'm not going to talk to somebody who doesn't have the desire. Secondly, I don't want to have to be the smartest person in the room. So I want to surround myself with smart people. Robert Kiyosaki always says that if you're the smartest person on your team, you need to get a new team. So we're constantly building people that are much better than us. Uh, and that's what you should be looking at is if I, if I'm interviewing you, well, Daniel, who else do you have on your team? Oh, you're by yourself. Well, you know, you know, that's not who I want to learn from. If Daniel says, well, I, you know, I've got 20 people, 40 people, hundred people that I work with that can all talk about me, vouch for me, whatever, then obviously that's a huge benefit to you. Then on top of that, when you've got, whether you call them students or customers or followers that can give you testimonials. And what I think is really sad is I've seen a lot of these gurus out there and I'm not talking names that many people know. I'm talking people that perceive to be gurus. We were just talking about this beforehand. I've worked, I worked with a lot of really cool people, but then I've worked with a lot of people who thought they were really cool. So that's a, a real difference in my opinion. And so, you know, they were standing on these stages touting their $50,000 watches. And I'm like, well, how does that have anything to do with me buying property? And so I'm not a flashy guy, but what I think is interesting is, you know, if, if you look at a lot of these internet people, they have one or two good testimonials and they keep using those one or two good testimonials for everything. And you're like, why is that guy? Or why is that lady on every advertising for them? You need to see a breadth of that, a depth of that, and, and to make sure that there's some longevity. The other thing I think people need to really, especially with property, and heck, we could even talk about it with, with Bitcoin or, or stocks, is a lot of people that have gotten into the game after 2008, and I don't care what game you got into, mm -hmm. cryptocurrency, property, um, the stock market, a lot of people have looked really smart over the last 13 years because the market has not really gone down. And so talk to somebody who has actually started investing before 2008 that went through the global financial crisis and still kept going and still was successful because when will it happen? I don't know when we're going to have another correction, but we will. And if anybody tells you that we won't, then obviously they're smoking something that they shouldn't be smoking. And so I think some of that is longevity. And it's been real. And we've seen a ton of people do have a ton of success since 2008, but they never went through a down market. And when property keeps going up in value, it's pretty easy to look successful. When Bitcoin keeps going up in value, it's pretty easy to look successful. It's, you know, what do you do in those down times? And I mean, uh, I, I come from a state where Warren Buffett's from in, in the U.S. called Nebraska. And, you know, Warren Buffett gets knocked a lot of times because he doesn't fall for some of the fads that are out there. And, uh, you know, a lot of people remember this back in the dot com days of the late 90s. He was getting chastised because he wasn't investing in any of these dot com prop or um, stocks. And they thought the Oracle of Omaha had lost his, his, his golden touch. And all he said was the same thing that we say in property. He said, I don't see that the price supports the earnings on these, on these companies. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? Price to earnings is the same as what I would call cash flow on a property. If a property price is here and the cash flow is down here, 
as a good friend of mine says, that's a crocodile property. That property is eating your cash flow every day. You want to have golden goose properties where the price is here and that cash flow every day is laying a golden, golden egg for you. So you're getting capital. So we have to understand those processes. And that's the same thing I look at is, you know, if you look at these experts that are out there, did they go through a down market? How long have they been doing this? What did they do in 2008? Did their business really suffer? Because those types of people, when you see that longevity, that means they've gone through the ups and the downs. Warren Buffett's been investing since the 60s. And if anybody wants to go see an ugly stock market time, look at the entire decade, not just a year. Look at the entire decade of the 70s. And I know a lot of people aren't old enough to even remember that. I don't remember it. I was a kid in the 70s. But the point is, we had an entire decade where the market literally didn't do much of anything other than go sideways. Yet a guy like Warren Buffett was continually building wealth. So you've got to find people who can make money in an up market, a down market, or a sideways market. And that's really what you're looking for with these internet phenoms that are out there is, you know, anybody can go buy a property and it goes up in value and they look like a hero, but we're going to see a lot of shakeout just like we did in 2008, uh, that that's not that easy. No, I completely agree. And I love what you say. We always say a mentor is someone that's done the same journey that you want to do and has faced challenges on the way and overcome them. Because, you know, if you've just been, so to speak, lucky, if you've just gone from, you know, great deal to great deal to great deal, probably haven't learned anything. You just happen to, I mean, you probably did some good cho choices in who you're working with, but basically you fell into some great partnerships. They take care of the deal and you just rode the wave. But it's when something goes wrong. It's when the Japanese knotweed turns out to be in your back garden. It's when the builder knocks down the wrong wall and all of a sudden you have a structural issue. That's where you, can, you see, do you actually know what you're doing? And, and that's where, that's where you learn something. So I, I completely agree. Just, just because someone did 500 deals in their first year, doesn't mean they actually know what they're doing in property. Well, and it, does it even mean that they can teach you? I like to use sports stars. There's yeah. a ton of great sports stars out there. I like to use Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson. These are, I'm a basketball fan. That's what I like. You're a baseball guy. I know that. Yeah. And so uh, Daniel's going, you remember that? Of course I remember that. Yeah. I mean, we can use a lot of sports stars as analogies or an examples. They're really great at playing the sport, but are they really good at teaching other people or coaching other people? Sometimes these people that are so good at something, they're really not good at teaching it because they just assume you should be able to do this, 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 and this. Oh, it's natural. Very, yeah. It's like, you know, of course you can make a three point shot. It's, you know, you lift the ball and you throw it in the basket. How hard is it? But yeah, and so you, very seldom do you see a real successful athlete become a real successful coach or even a manager of a team because it's a different skill set. So I always tell students, I'm not the best investor out there. I know that. I did fine. I do fine. But I got a lot better people around me because I know that for our business, our company to grow and for our students to be successful is you've got to have people that are really good at teaching it not just good at doing it. I'll never forget. I had an interview with Robert Kiyosaki in, I'm going to say 2009, 2010, whatever year it was. And I remember him shaking my hand. He said, the world needs good teachers. And, and there's no doubt about that. And, and that was a pretty cool thing for him to say to me. I mean, I, I mean, not that I just want to be a teacher, but what I know is you can be a good investor and a great teacher. And, and that is an empowering thing. And when you can do both of those things, it's a very fulfilling life that you lead. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. So, so let's say now I have a passion. I have a desire. I have found someone that I trust. They've gone through the ups. They've gone through the downs. They've gotten to the other side. They're still doing well. And they have the ability to teach. What are the systems that I want to start putting into place to make sure I'm successful? Well, the first thing I think we need to look at with property is how do we leverage it? Because if you're just using your own money or savings or equity from a property you already have, your limits the amount of growth that you have. So you need to understand creative finance, as we call it. And when I can understand creative finance and leverage my money, my time, my, my efforts with other people's money, time, and efforts, now I can do this business smart. I don't have to work 80, 90, 100 hours a week to do it. I can do that one property a year. And the thing is, when I say one property a year, you may work really hard for a few months getting that property. 
But once you get the property and it's cash flowing, what do you have to do the rest of the year? Not a lot. And so that's where, and, and what's going to happen is probably once you get that first one, you go, oh, I got that figured out. I'm going to get a second one. That's why I tell people one or two properties a year, you're going to be amazing. So I think what we have to learn first and foremost is creative financing, because the average person that I meet that isn't sitting there with a half a million euros or pounds or whatever, that probably wouldn't be a lot in, what are you, Krona? Is that what? Uh, so half a million Krona does give you the deposit for deal number one, but not more than that. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the numbers being really high as far as how many Krona versus a dollar or a pound or whatever, but anyway. And so, you know, not, not a lot of people have a half million, let's just call them pounds, euros, dollars, not Krona, because I don't know the, the, the exchange rates, but most, most people don't have that. So we've got to learn to use creative finance. And that's the first system I would learn. Find somebody else in your life, find a mentor, find a teacher, find a coach, find a program that will teach you creative financing. Because if you find that, now what you can start to do is leverage your own money and leverage your own deals. Does that mean you may have to pay for that program? Yeah. Invest in a program that's going to show you how to get creative financing because if you just use your money to buy one property, you got one property and you're done. If you invest your money to get creative, to learn how to do creative financing now, they can teach you how to get a bunch of properties. And that's, you know, one of the things I would tell you. Secondly, we always look at the numbers. Due diligence on the numbers is utmost importance. And that property should cash flow no matter whether the market's going up, down, or sideways. Uh, and, and a lot of people talk about looking at a market for demand. Make sure that there's good jobs, there's good infrastructure, there's a desire to be in that area. We've got some areas in the U.S. that you can go buy properties cheap. But that doesn't mean they're good deals because the, the infrastructure is crumbling. Uh, people are moving out of those cities. And even though something's cheap, the reason it's cheap is because there's not a lot of demand for that supply. It's a simple economics thing. So those are probably the three things I would look at. And that would be creative financing. Obviously, it, it is the pillar to everything that we do. Uh, making sure that we're always buying for cash flow because that's a huge thing. And third, being in an area where we see positive signs of growth, positive signs of demand, rather than an area that might be. And, and, and the thing about it is most any place you go, there's, and I don't always call them government agencies, but different government things that can show you, hey, this is where the city is putting money. This is where the growth potential is. We know there's a new freeway or highway or whatever motorway coming through this area. So that's going to increase the amount of traffic you know, that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of things you can look at that, you know, from, from a research standpoint. So those are the top three things, but probably not even nearly as important as just getting off your assets and doing something. Because a lot of people, they read about this, they do all their due diligence, they look at spreadsheets until they're blue in the face and then they don't do anything. So you gotta, you gotta, you know, what's the old saying, you know, not, and I don't know if we call it Nike where you're at, but we call it Nike here in the US, you know, their whole saying is just do it. How many shoes do you think they'd sell if it was just think about it? So you got to get out there and do it. No, I love that. I love that. And I love that you bring those things up. I mean, creative finance, there are so many options. I mean, I've spoken on a lot of podcasts where I've been the interviewee where because we've identified 25 different ways to fund a property deal. And that's just the deposit. Then you have all the creative ways of structuring the deal. There are so many ways you can do it. And I mean, the due diligence on the area, on the deal, that is key. So you're buying the right deal in the right area for the right reasons with the right team. If you get those two things right, you're financing it in the right way, you're buying the right deal, then, then you'll do well and you'll do well. So Pip, thank you so much for joining us. If we want to connect with you further, if we want to learn more from you, how do we find you? Well, if you can see that, I don't know if the name comes up on the recording. I don't think it does, but just... Um, Probably the easiest way, Daniel, is uh, PIP at PIP's Path. So it's P-I-P at P-I-P-S-P-A-T-H dot com. PIP at PIP's Path dot com. I'll add that in the show notes, everyone, so you don't yeah. have to try to figure out that spelling. But PIP isn't so, too yeah. hard. It's P-I-P. So PIP's Path. <laughs> PIP at it, PIP's it, Path dot com. That sounds great. There you go. And then, yeah, and then obviously our website is just pipspath.com. So you can look it up there and get in touch with us that way. So awesome. Awesome. I'll add that to the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you everyone for listening. I really appreciate you taking the time to spend here with us. Hopefully you get some good value out of it. And I got some exciting news for you in a moment. So stay tuned. 
Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you got a lot of value. Again, if you implement this, this is what has separated those who become wildly successful from those who don't. Now, in next week's episode, we are meeting Michelle Cairns, who is going to share with us how she raises money for her property investments. This is going to be really, really powerful because that is one of the things that often stops us, right? We find all these deals or we have sourcing agents to find us the deals. Well, how do we get the money? Well, in our next episode, that is what we're going to learn. So super, super exciting. Make sure you subscribe to the Momentum Investing Podcast so that you don't miss a single episode. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to the channel, you like the video, and of course, keep an eye out for our Tuesday finance updates where we go through if there's an inflation coming, deflation coming, there's actually arguments for both. We look at how you invest, how you protect yourself either way. And then on Saturdays, we have Passive Income Mastery where, well, on one of our latest episodes, we share 25 different ways you can fund your property deals. So a lot of great stuff there. Check it out. And I'll see you next week with Michelle Cairns. Welcome.